Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Dr. John James. Dr. John James has worked in the field of allergy, asthma, and immunology for more than 30 years. He is a board certified. He is board certified by the American Board of Allergy and Immunology and has had clinical experience in diagnosis and management of allergic diseases and asthma with a special interest in food allergy and anaphylaxis. Dr. James has a medical, was a medical school faculty member at the University of Arkansas in Little Rock and worked with Colorado Allergy and Asthma Centers for 24 years before retiring in 2020. So without further ado, I will pass this along to Dr. James. Thank you so much, Tiffany, for that introduction. And I'm really honored to be asked to do another webinar for FAIR. I, my disclosures are that I am a president of a consulting company called Food Allergy consulting and education services, and I do uh, consulting work for both FAIR and for AFA, which is the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. So we'll start with our sort of overall uh, outline here. We'll have some definitions of food allergy, mechanisms, background information, clinical presentations, and a diagnosis and management. I'm, this talk is in two parts. We'll start with the pollen allergy um, pollen allergy and food allergy syndrome, and then we'll talk about pets and how they impact uh, allergic disease. So just an introduction on food allergy. Uh, a food allergy is the body's immune system that sees a certain food as harmful and reacts by causing symptoms. A food allergy is a specific immune response that occurs reproducibly on exposure to a given food. IgE-mediated reactions are very common to peanut, cow milk, eggs, and tree nuts, and there's a whole variety of other foods that, that can cause these reactions as well. Allergic reactions can cause um, adverse symptoms in the skin, that's the most common area, mouth, eyes, the GI tract or gut, the lungs, heart, and brain. Reactions can be mild, but there can also be severe reactions such as anaphylaxis, which can be life-threatening. On the other side, there's food intolerances, which are a non-immune physiologic response following the ingestion of food, such as metabolic reaction, toxic reactions, pharmacologic reactions. The most common reaction would be lactose intolerance. Many of you are familiar with this food intolerance. So the public perception of food allergy is about 20 to 25% of the population. Approximately 32 million people in the United States have food allergies, so much less than that 20 to 25 percent. Approximately 11 percent of adults have food allergies, 10 percent of children, and of these, 3 percent are severe reactions, and 2.4 percent of children have multiple food allergies. And up to 8 percent of infants under two years of age in the infancy range would have food allergies. The prevalence of food allergy is higher in those who have atopic conditions such as eczema or atopic dermatitis, pollen allergies or hay fever, and asthma. There is an increased prevalence of food allergy over the past two decades, up about 18%. And there is a known tripling of peanut allergy over the past two decades. And peanut allergy is about 2% of the U.S. population currently. So I'll just give a sort of an overview of Ig-mediated reactions or immediate reactions to foods. So we'll just use peanut as an example. Peanuts ingested, it's broken down in the, in the gut, and the allergens are presented to the immune system in that top left area. The immune system processes the allergen and talks to other immune cells, plasma cells, to make specific IgE antibodies or allergen-specific IgE molecules. And these become fixed to uh, mast cells, which are very important in the allergic process. And then when allergen is reintroduced or eaten and ingested again, that uh, cross-links these um, IgE molecules on the surface of mast cells and a whole cascade of things happen. Uh, mediators are released and they can affect the skin, they can affect uh, the lungs, they can affect the gut and even anaphylaxis. So it, this is just an overview of an Ig mediated uh, reaction. And again, different from food intolerance. So food, uh, pollen food allergy syndrome, the original term was oral allergy syndrome was coined in 1987. The name pollen food allergy syndrome was proposed in 1995 to better characterize 
this syndrome in terms of the pathogenesis, the, um, the symptoms such as the mouth symptoms, systemic symptoms that can occur in response to pollen-related foods. Symptoms of allergies to various foods uh, occur in patients who typically have allergic rhinitis or hay fever. The main cross-reactivities between food allergens and airborne pollens are listed here. Birch pollen, ragweed pollen, mugwort, and grass pollen. We're going to go into detail with these in further slides. So pollen food allergy syndrome, the epidemiology, is the most common form of food allergy in adults. The estimated prevalence is 5% of the general population. In Denmark, 74% of those reporting pollen allergy have pollen food allergy syndromes, very, very high in that part of Europe. The overall estimated prevalence in children and adults is between five and 40%. So this is a high range uh, and there's multiple studies here and, and there are different prevalence, but just to give you that, that idea or set the stage for how common this would be. This slide is, is sort of a cartoon to show um, the pathogenesis of pollen food allergy syndrome. So I'm gonna use birch pollen at that top left, birch pollen and in, this, uh, in, in certain fruits, especially apple, there are cross-reactive proteins or allergens that a person can react to if they have this pollen food allergy syndrome. So again, the plasma cells make IgE that binds to mast cells. And when, when the apple is ingested, fresh apple in someone who has birch pollen allergy, there can be a release of these chemicals that kind of mainly affect the lips and oral mucosa causing redness, swelling and itching, but can also lead to high skin symptoms. GI symptoms, nausea, stomach pain, cramps, vomiting, diarrhea, respiratory symptoms that, as it gets more severe, coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, throat tightness, trouble swallowing, hoarseness, and nasal congestion. Cardiovascular symptoms, now we're getting really, really systemic here, dizziness, uh, changes in color of mucosal membranes, weak pulse, hypotension or low blood pressure, even shock or anaphylaxis. So this is, can be, it's, we'll talk about the more common symptoms, but the spectrum can be in some patients, a systemic reaction. So the pathogenesis of food allergens belong to specific protein families and examples here, this is a little more detail than you probably need, but there are things called lipid transfer proteins. It's our, these are allergens, pan allergens found in many fruits and vegetables. And I listed examples here, apple, peach, hazelnut, peanut, soy, walnut, and wheat. So everything from fruits to tree nuts to grains here. Then there are albumins that are found in peanut and cashew that can have cross-reactive uh, uh, involvement with pollen food allergy syndrome. And then the pathogenous related family or birch pollen, which has the highest prevalence of pollen food allergy syndrome and the, the fruits and, and nuts here, and, and here are apple, cherry, apricot, pear, celery, carrot, soybean, hazelnut, and peanut. So clinical features, most patients have clinical symptoms of, they have a, a, a past history of hay fever or asthma in response to pollen. So that may be the first way they were sensitized to an allergen birch pollen in the air, ragweed pollen in the air, and they develop hay fever or asthma. There can be seasonal variations because tree pollen is typically in the springtime of year and ragweed is typically problematic in the late summer and fall. So symptoms may increase during those relevant pollen seasons. And that's where their symptoms might, might show up when they eat those foods that react. Symptoms develop in response to eating typically the raw, uncooked form of food or a fresh form of apple, say apple or peach or plum or cherries. And the patient may tolerate cooked, baked, or processed forms of that food, say apple and an applesauce or a canned form of some other fruit. But the exception would be in tree nuts. So tree nuts across the board, if they are if they're freshly eaten or if they're baked or cooked, they the reaction would occur in all those situations. So the most common symptoms that occur within 
five to 10 minutes of food ingestion, so immediate uh, symptoms, mouth and throat itching or tingling, swelling or mild redness of the lips or mouth, swelling and tightness in the throat, laryngeal edema, that's called, difficulty swallowing, dysphonia, difficulty talking because the vocal cords are in the larynx is involved, and itching of the nose and or ears. 3% of patients experience anaphylaxis or a systemic allergic reaction, and they may not have oral symptoms. So they could go right into a systemic reaction. And about 1.7% experience anaphylactic shock. So that's, that's a low blood pressure, poor perfusion, um, things like that that we talked about earlier. So on physical exam with pollen food allergy syndrome, there you can see a physician or health care provider uh, physician assistant, nurse practitioner would see swelling of the tongue in the uvula, which is a tissue in the very back of the, of the mouth, lips, swelling of the lips, swelling of the face and around the eyes, eyelids, localized hives around the mouth, irritation, so redness and irritation around the mouth, and other symptoms consistent with allergic rhinoconjunctivitis or hay fever. So red eyes, swollen nasal membranes or the turbinates, post-nasal drainage, and irritation of the throat. So these are things that we look for in the physical exam. They're going to be things we look for typically in patients who have allergic rhinitis, but patients are complaining of these reactions with certain food ingestion. So the pollen food allergy syndrome, uh, this is the pollen allergy and associated foods. These are important to know. So in the birch pollen allergy patient, they could complain of reactions with apple, peach, pear, plum, carrot, and celery. These are the common fruits that are and fruits and vegetables seen in, in that group of patients. With mugwort or pollen allergy, it's celery, carrot, parsley, and mustard. With ragweed pollen allergy patients, and again, this is in the fall time of the year, banana, melons, kiwi, and cucumber. And with grass pollen allergy patients, this is typically in the late spring, early summer, and like Bermuda grass, Timothy grass, they would react to tomato, potato, and peanuts. Just to give you a spectrum here to know the, the associations. This slide is a little more detailed and it just shows the cross reactivity patterns in pollen food allergy syndrome patients just to put it all together. So again, birch, you can see the variety of, of fruits, vegetables, even tree nuts, uh, in the far right, uh, ragweed, uh, the melons, zucchini, cucumber, and then banana, it's common. And then in the mugwort is a whole variety of things from celery to mustard to vegetables and um, black pepper. So again, just to set the stage for, for patients coming in, I, I think in, in my clinical practice, I would a lot of times see the adult patients come in and complain about this, eating these foods and having symptoms, having food allergy reactions, and they they weren't recognized as such. So they may have talked to their primary care physician or other health healthcare provider, and no one made that association or that connection. There, there could be a food allergy in association or link to their pollen allergy. So high-risk foods that we might see that could be uh, put patients at high risk for anaphylaxis are listed here from almonds, apricots, cherries, all the way down to tomatoes. And there certainly can be a potential negative impact on that individual's quality of life. So obviously, if they, if they have multiple foods they're not able to ingest and they, they can get worse certain times of the year during their pollen seasons, well, it's really going to put a damper on their quality of life. And, and if they're not diagnosed, that's really a problem. So we need to identify these patients from their history, physical exam, and then um, testing. I wanted to focus on latex fruit syndrome here. 30 to 50% of patients with latex allergy can have an associated allergy reactions to certain foods, fruit allergens. And the, the examples would be avocado, banana, kiwi, and chestnut. Those four are the big ones. And then also listed peach, tomato, white potato, and bell pepper. So some of you, if you have latex allergy, you're aware of this. And we, if someone has latex allergy in our clinic, we need to be aware of this to counsel patients on this. 
It's unclear whether the latex allergic sensitization precedes or follows the onset of food allergy. And the exact route of sensitization is unknown. Is it coming through the skin, through the mucous membranes, or inhalation? So what about di for the diagnosing pollen food allergy syndrome? Well, we have to have a clinical history that we've covered previously. It needs to be a strong, reliable clinical history. And then we look for evidence of allergic sensitization. We can do this in multiple ways. The most common way is to do allergy skin testing to relevant pollens and foods. So the, the typical testing is percutaneous or prick uh, skin testing, puncture skin testing with commercial extracts of specific fruits and vegetables. Now they may have already been skin tested to pollen like birch pollen or ragweed pollen. And this is skin testing with foods. Uh, to put that together, the associations. There's also something called prick by prick testing where we're doing skin testing using the fresh fruit, apple, banana, uh, kiwi, melons, and we do prick testing with that fresh fruit. Then we do prick testing or percutaneous testing on the patient's skin. There's also blood testing. So we may not be able to do skin testing because the patient's on antihistamines or has severe atopic dermatitis. So blood testing is obtaining blood and measuring specific Ig antibodies that route versus doing it on the skin test. And component testing is a is a higher level blood test that's looking at of allergens in say peanut or or or, or other other tree nuts and grains, looking for the individual allergens per se, not the whole protein. So smaller um, allergenic parts of peanut that would be important to know for food allergy. And finally, oral food challenges can be done. This is the gold standard to really uh, rule in or rule out a, a food allergy. So sometimes we have to go to food challenges to really confirm the diagnosis or rule it out. And this is really the 100% test. So differential diagnosis, there can be that things that could mimic pollen food allergy syndrome. There could be an isolated food allergy, such as to a melon or peach, and there's no, there's no other association with a pollen allergy. There can be local irritation around the mouth, the tongue, the throat, from a spicy or tart food like pineapple, but it's not a food, re a food allergy. It could be a food intolerance reaction. Contact hives from, say, tomato sauce, which can cause a contact or a carrier when it comes in contact with the skin, but it's not an IgE-mediated allergic reaction. This can also happen with citrus fruits and garlic. A perioral or around-the-mouth dermatitis or contact dermatitis. Gastrosophic reflux, not as common, but patients that eat foods might have symptoms in the esophagus or feeling that food is coming up into their larynx, uh, re reflux symptoms, burning, uh, discomfort with food ingestion and the eosinophilic esophagitis, which is an allergic reaction in the esophagus, but not pollen food allergy syndrome. So what about treatment? We certainly need to spend a lot of time on specific education about pollen food allergy syndrome. What we've covered in the presentation so far, we need to educate. A lot of patients don't know about this syndrome. They just haven't never been come onto the radar. So we need to educate about what it is, what the symptoms are, what the foods, uh, common food associations, elimination of the offending foods, the typical treatment for food allergy, avoiding raw foods that cause uh, cross reactions. Then knowing about baked or cooked foods can uh, be safe for patients to ingest. So baked fruits or vegetables may not trigger the reaction. Eating canned fruits or vegetables because they're processed and the allergens are broken down peeling the food because the protein often is concentrated in the skin or the peel of the fruit. So right under, say, an orange, the peel, that's where the allergens could be. So peeling the food, the patients may say, hey, I'm able to eat that, uh, that form of the food, but not um, other forms. So examples of fresh fruits that may be needed to avoid. This is just one example here in this picture, but we talked about tree nuts, we talked about grains, in addition to fresh fruits and vegetables. So treatment uh, going moving forward would be establishing a written treatment plan between the healthcare provider and the patient and other caregivers. Taking oral antihistamines really for only the very mildest of symptoms, oral itching, uh, but if the, but having an epinephrine auto-injector, if there is a history of lower airway symptoms, 
cough, wheezing, shortness of breath. If there's a current diagnosis of asthma, which can be exacerbated by pollen food allergy syndrome, if there are parenteral symptoms such as the dysphonia, the tightening in the throat, facial edema, more involved reactions, more involved swelling, and generalized or hives that are all over the body when in the history of uh, when the when certain fresh fruits and vegetables are ingested in a pollen allergic patient. In terms of immunotherapy, well, we know that subcutaneous immunotherapy or SCIT, there can be an improvement in pollen food allergy syndrome in up to 80% of patients. This is this is encouraging. So a patient who has hay fever and pollen and a food allergy, PFAS, if they undergo immunotherapy over time when they get on maintenance therapy, they can see an improvement in their pollen food allergy syndrome. So we can tell this, tell this to patients on the front end as, a, as an encouraging way to get them on immunotherapy as a, a successful treatment route. Sublingual immunotherapy, not as much. We don't have as good studies here. This is where the allergen is under the tongue versus an injection under the skin with the allergen mixture. And this, this is also another way to treat um, allergic rhinitis. So conclusions. Um, there's results in several food allergies that's from that homology or similarity between the plant allergen and the food protein allergen that we talked about early. So the immune system is, is making these specific antibodies that react to both. It can't really discriminate between those allergens in the uh, food and the pollen. The true prevalence has not been completely established. We talked about that wide range of 5 to 40%. Prevalence is a variable based on geographical distribution. So if you're part of the country where there's a lot of pollen allergy and different types of pollen, well, it's you're more likely if you're an allergic person to have pollen food allergy syndrome than a part of the country where there's minimal pollen allergy. And it can change throughout the time of the year during the relevant allergy seasons. It's more common in a topic individuals, meaning allergy prone, people with allergic rhinitis, people with asthma, people with atopic dermatitis they're a higher risk to develop the syndrome. We talked about education, the risk of reactions, severity of reactions, potential cross-reactive foods, how foods are prepared, developing that written treatment plan, uh, plan, and then when to prescribe epinephrine, which is the gold standard treatment for anaphylactic reactions. So um, this is sort of the transition uh, slide, and we will have time at the end for questions. So I'm gonna, um, move on. If you have never been to the International Balloon Festival, I'll plug this. I went this past, I've been a couple of times. It's wonderful. Uh, this this year, there were like 600 balloons and they it was amazing to see these take off uh, on the day we were there. It was, it was really amazing. Uh, okay, now we're going to move into the pet exposure uh, early in life and how that can impact food allergy. You may have heard a lot about this. A lot of press came out this spring with a, the study I'm going to review today. Um, uh, in this presentation. So we talked about food allergy in the previous part of the talk, but I'll just hit on a couple of high points here. Incidence of food allergy has increased over the past many years, uh, especially peanut allergy. Approximately 10% of children have food allergy in developed countries, 8% of infants. The impact of food allergy, as many of you know well, it's reduction in quality of life in patients and their caregivers, significant medical cost burden, uh, like emergency room visits, hospitalizations, cost of medications, taking extra care when traveling and then going out to eat. So it can be a significant burden. And the the um, risk for anaphylactic reactions, that, that's a very um, uh, big concern and knowing to be prepared for when to treat, how to treat. And, and when traveling, when going to restaurants, when going to schools where there could be a possible exposure. Preventing occurrence is a major priority and working with the healthcare provider, developing that written, treat, uh, written treatment plan. So what, what could be the possible benefits of early exposure to animals? Possible benefits, uh, early, of, early life exposure to animals and reduction of allergy. Well, we'll be talking about dogs and cat exposure. I'm not going to talk about in general farm animals, but we know this is part of what was called the hygiene hypothesis. And this it was the studies were done in Central Europe, in the Amish country, and in dairy farms. 
and also exposure to pests, mites, and cockroaches and disadvantage inner city homes. So it's a variety of exposures that could impact the uh, development of allergy early in life. So it could be a reassurance to pet owners helping the decision about keeping the pets in the home or whether or not to obtain a new pet and finally, whether or not to remove a pet from home. That has to happen in some cases because people do develop allergies to pets uh, and they, the removal of the pet is necessary. So the message will be a biodiverse or diverse environment can promote immune development in health and healthy children. So the hygiene hypothesis it was suggesting that pet exposure, exposure to farm animals, exposure to uh, microbes can be effective in pre preventing allergic diseases and, and may provide an overall immunologic benefit. I'm sure many of you have heard about this. This has been around for many years. So in terms of pets, uh, there have been a many, many studies over the past uh, 10, 15 years. Initially, the initial study uh, by Jim Gern reported no significant effect of cat and dog ownership at birth on food allergy at one year of age. This Mars study, and I'll talk about this toward the end of the talk, reported that dog exposure during fetal development or early infancy decreases incident risk of food allergy at age one to three years. This 2020 study by Smegda uh, reported dog exposure both during, before and during pregnancy decreases the risk of food allergy during the first year of life. The Copland study in 2012 found indoor pet dog exposure was in, inversely related with egg allergy at one year. So if there was dog exposure, then there was decreased uh, incidence of egg allergy at one year. And this last study by Peter et al. was 2015, having dog indoors was inversely proportioned to multiple food allergies at one year. So this just is to set the stage for what we're gonna talk about in this most recent study coming up. And there's an importance in the timing of exposure, fetal development versus early infancy or both. So that those are important issues to discuss. So to step back a little bit, what are animal allergens? What are the general features? Well, with, with pet dander, the, the dead flakes of the skin are allergenic, not the hair of the pet. The allergens are, the, can be present in the skin, the saliva, and the urine of the cat or dog, and they can trigger allergic reactions. In some individuals, they can aggravate asthma attacks or asthma exacerbations. The pet Hair or fur can collect pollen. So when that pet is outdoors in the pollen season, say during the birch tree pollen season or the ragweed pollen season, though that pollen can collect in the fur or hair, and then they can bring that in the home, and that can be a problem. And also mold spores, uh, I meant to mention there, and these can impact allergic rhinitis and asthma. And this is interesting, detectable dog and cat allergens can be in the home, even in homes without pets. So this happens because, say, a child's at school and other kids have dogs and cats and there's allergen on their clothing, on their shoes, and then it goes on to that individual's clothing. They come home, they deposit that in the home. So there's ways for that allergen to come into the home, even if there's not pets in that home. So these allergens are very small particles, the allergens that become airborne. The dander can remain airborne for long periods of time. It can be sticky onto walls, onto carpets, onto furniture and clothing. Early exposure to dogs before one year of age may help be protective in preventing allergic sensitization. And one other thing to mention on the slide is that that's why the special filters like HEPA filters, high efficiency particular air filters, can be useful in homes because it does filter out this airborne allergen. So that's a, sort of an aside, but it is something to be aware of. So exposure to dog allergen can promote tolerance. Early exposure to dogs in the home in the first several years of life can be protective for the development of allergic diseases and asthma. Early dog exposure in homes can lower the risk of allergic sensitization to an array of allergens, but we're mainly focusing on pets today. Greater microbial or bacterial presence, higher levels of endotoxin, which can be on the um, the pets has been documented at homes with dogs. Endotoxin is, is a bacterial product that has been shown 
to is part of that hygiene hypothesis that can be promote the, or can decrease the development of allergens in our early life. It's possible that children living with dogs may be exposed to pet allergens in combination with these microbial products such as endotoxin, which can act like immunotherapy or a promotion of tolerance. So an exposure to cats can promote tolerance. Children living in house with cats can be um, sensitized to cat allergens or develop specific IG antibodies. It's, a, it's possible that living with cat may also uh, lead to development of cat-specific tolerance, just like we mentioned with dogs. The mechanism is, is not clear, but this, the major cat allergen is called FELD1. That's, that's the main known allergen in, in cats. It can reach airborne levels that can be very high and may promote desensitization. So with immunotherapy that we get by injections, the skit, we are, we are we're formulating these, these uh, mixtures to administer by shots or allergen immunotherapy to help that aller the allergic patient to become tolerant to cat allergens. And finally, airborne levels of FELD1 could be similar to doses of cat allergies used in subcutaneous or sublingual immunotherapy. So the timing and dose of initial exposure is important. So it's got to be, we think, in that first uh, part of life. Uh, in, in Sweden, they found that the, the, there was a greatest reduction in allergic diseases as the number of pets increased. Adults with new exposure to pets found that exposure seemed to correlate directly with sensitization, and then especially in areas where there might be high levels in the bedroom if the, if the pet is allowed in the bedroom. And the risk of becoming sensitized was, was highest in those who were already sensitized to other allergens and those with asthma, like asthma or allergic rhinitis or eczema. So it, it, we talked about that in the pollen food allergy syndrome. If, if, if you have an atopic individual, well, the risk of becoming sensitized is certainly gonna be higher. So now we'll focus on this PLOS one study. You may be familiar, this got a lot of attention in the lay press and scientific press uh, earlier this year. So association between fetal or infant exposure and the development of food allergens was done in uh, Japan by these investigators. It was uh, published in March of this year, and that's the uh, access to that journal um, listed there. So the study aim was to explore the effect of pet exposure to various species of pets and the risk of food allergens. So they obtained data on pet exposure and allergy from uh, the Japan Environmental Children's Study. It's a nationwide prospective birth cohort study that included all the pregnancies between January 11th and March of 2014. They examined associations between exposure to various species of pets during both fetal development and early infancy and the incidence of food allergies. Information was obtained from the medical records and self-administered questionnaires. Over 66,000 children were included in this analysis. And they examined children's risk of developing food allergies up to three years of age. Focusing on pet ownerships linked to food allergies overall and a variety of specific food allergies. They conducted these the statistics for logistic regression analysis for each pet species, cause of the foods, and timing of exposure. So children exposed to cats or dogs had a 13 to 16 percent lower risk of all food allergies compared to babies in pet-free homes. Dog ownership reduced the risk of um, can't see that on the slide. It's let me get that off of there. To risk of egg, milk, and nut allergies. Cat ownership reduced the risk of egg, wheat, and soybean allergies. Exposure to dog and cats might be beneficial against the development of certain food allergies, thereby alleviating concerns about pet keeping, which may and may also reduce the burden of food allergies, which would be the really the holy grail in this in this situation. So this slide is a little little detailed, but it's it's sort of I picked out of this study 
for cats and dogs mainly, I didn't because these were the significant changes seen um, in the incidence of food allergies up to three years of age. So any pet in that top uh, row, the uh, incidence, the decrease was 11 percent, and the adjusted odds ratio is is listed there, 95 percent confidence interval, which is very good. And then then I break it down into indoor dog exposure during fetal development. It was 10.7 percent decrease. Um, dog indoors during infancy was 11.6 percent, and then for cats during fetal exposure and indoor cats in infancy. So all of these showed a decrease in the incidence of food allergies, um, as mentioned on the previous slide. So benefits of early life exposure to animals and reduction of allergy. We This is from pets, which we talked about in this study. And then a reassurance to pet owners helps in the decision of whether or not to keep the pets in the home or to obtain a new pet. And the biodiverse environment that I mentioned early on. So possible mechanisms. Well, the pet exposure can affect the infant's gut my, microbiota directly or indirectly uh, by the home environment. And the state of the infant's gut microbiota may affect the immune system and induce IgE sensitization. So the, the thought here is that, okay, with this pet exposure and maybe with the endotoxin, we talked about that too, could these factors be affecting how that exposure is in, in the gut microbiome, I guess is the term you most of you be familiar with. Could it affect that? And that be one of the mechanisms. Now, this is not known for sure, but is one of the proposed mechanisms. So endotoxin mediated mechanism, pet ownership can increase endotoxin levels in the home, which may lead to a protection against allergic sensitization. The skin barrier mediated mechanism, if there's a disruption of this barrier, like an atopic dermatitis, well, that could lead to allergic sensitization to foods and be a, a problem for the development of, say, uh, peanut allergy, milk allergy, or egg allergy. So uh, these mechanisms may help explain the suppressive effect or the development of tolerance. But I, I want to point out here, we this is not a known definite uh, thing at this point. These are proposed mechanisms that need to be studied further. So the strength of this uh, Japan study was that it was they used a very large sample of the general population across Japan. It was a longitudinal design which minimized the possibility of just a causal reversal. And the most confounding information that al it allowed for adjustments of any other covariance in the, in, that would have an impact. Limitations here obviously would be that, that would they were self-reported questionnaire data from the parents. So it relied on the parents' recollection, not direct allergy testing um, or food challenges. So was recall bias a concern? Certainly that could be a concern. The study cannot prove that pets themselves, rather than something else about pet owners, was the true cause of lowering the odds of food allergy development. The large size of the study may have overinterpreted the relationship between pets and specific food allergies. Uh, numerous comparisons were made. Uh, there may have been some random association. So that's, there's certainly limitations to the study. It's very interesting. And more studies need to be done to confirm this uh, going forward. Uh, other factors that could have influenced the the onset of allergy would be the maternal mother's age, history of allergic disease, which we've talked about before, smoking status, and place of residence. So I mentioned this Mars study early, earlier on. It's a 2019 study. Directly tested young children for food allergies uh, other than relying just on questionnaires and showed that the uh, infants living who were in homes living with dogs reduced the odds of developing a food allergy by 90%. The more dogs in the home, the better. Uh, none of the infants who live with at least two dogs developed a food allergy. So this study is an isolated study again, and, and again, we'll, be, we'll see what time as studies are done and, the, and they become more available in the publication. This, is this going to be, are these going to hold true? Issues that need um, further investigation, well, the timing of exposure, 
during uh, fetal development or during early infancy and, and, and uh, infant development. How much uh, time exposed to the pet? Uh, did COVID have an effect here? Well, certainly people were indoors more during the COVID epidemic, and that could have played a role in, 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 in tolerance development. Effect of strong family history on atopy and, and these uh, findings. Uh, and I said it before, but this, this large Japanese study, which gained a lot of press attention, it does need to be confirmed with further studies. And we hope that will be, I think those studies are underway. We'll find out. So pay attention to this and uh, we'll hopefully get more and more um, reliable data here. Uh, so it would be useful to have randomized trials uh, that prospectively over time can determine if pet exposure will lead to, will play an impact, have an impact on development of food allergy. So we have, and that, that timing was good. So we have plenty of time for questions. I'm gonna let Tiffany, um, one of the first questions that I got, when we got even prior to the, to the uh, webinar was this issue about exposure mm -hmm. to, pet, to pet allergens and endotoxin and hygiene hypothesis. And I, and I tried to cover that in the talk and the microbiome in the gut. Well, all these factors could be playing a role. Do we know which one is the most important? No. We know that they're most likely playing a role. We don't know what combination is the most important. These are things we're going to know going forward. So I, I can't answer that question with a specific answer, but we know they're certainly uh, playing a role here. So Tiffany, I'll let you take over. Yeah, we, we got a lot of questions on the development of food allergies. Um, you know, th that question came in and just for the audience so they know what was asked. Um, if having pets around alter gut bacteria due to different microbes they carry around inside and outside of their bodies and how this impacts food allergies. But we got questions also, and I'm going to lump these together, but are food allergies also genetic? Um, do we know what's causing the overall increase in food allergies and peanuts in particular? Is it related to the past thought to wait to introduce allergens? Is it related to formula usage? Can you can you comment on the overall increase um, in the prevalence? So first, I would say the family history certainly plays a role in all allergic diseases. So if you have one or both parents or there are already siblings who have food allergies, and other atopic conditions, well, there's going to be a higher likelihood that that, that newborn, the infant, is going to, does have a chance. That doesn't mean it's a, it's a super high chance, but it can be up to, say, with peanut, we know about a 7% chance. If one sibling has peanut allergy, well, the, the other, the next sibling has a 7% chance of developing peanut allergy. We don't know this with all individual foods, but we do know that there, there can be an increased risk with family history. The question about why is there an increase in food allergy over the past two to three decades is it's not likely one thing. It's likely many things. It's probably related to diet, though, especially in westernized countries, dietary factors, other environmental factors, the way we live, the, the hygiene hypothesis could be playing a role here, cleaner environments, cleaner living. Well, how does that affect the immune system and in what we were talking about with the with the microbiome and exposure to these uh, my, these uh, micro these bacterial micro uh, biome or or endotoxin prod like products, um, unfortunately we don't know uh, the reason. With you know it be I wish I could tell you one specific thing, uh, but you but I oh, the other thing I want to mention was the, we do know that early introduction of some of the major uh, food allergies like peanut, milk, and egg. If you, there's a window of time we know between four and six months where if we introduce some of these highly allergenic foods, especially in, 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 in infants who have eczema or say egg allergy already, then we can make a really big difference in preventing food allergy in that individual. So these prevention studies, there are many of these studies in, in the literature and and we talk about these, we have many conferences talking about this, many of the journal articles that come out are on these specific topics. So there are prevention measures that can be done and this is very encouraging for us as healthcare providers and for parents who have who have a history of uh, atopy. 
Yeah, I mean, there have been a lot of things that have been studied, you know, low vitamin D, you mentioned the hygiene hypothesis, we're talking about um, the presence of animals, whether it's, you know, an indoor cat or a dog, but also being around a farm, like there have been a lot of things that have been studied, um, exclusive breastfeeding, formula use, it, but nothing, like you said, has been totally conclusive um, as to why there is a prevalence. And we're seeing food allergy diagnosis occurring even later, you know, in, in adulthood, we're, we're seeing that even, even more and more. Um, someone asked if you could develop food allergies as you get older. And the answer is yes. There's not like a, there's not a cutoff date to when you can develop a food allergy. Um, let me just, I'll, just I'll, I'll chime in there too. Sure. Uh, we know now that adults, we know that about 10% of 10, 11% of adults develop food allergies and half of those individuals develop them during adulthood. So Tiffany alluded to that. That is, that is known now it's been studied and published and it, that is a big thing because patients may say, Hey, I was, I ate shrimp all my life and I'm just I had this reaction. I'm really upset because I want, and they haven't eat maybe an anaphylactic reaction to shrimp or to a peanut or a tree nut. So that is a, that's a definite concern in some adult patients. Yeah. It's definitely when, when you've been eating something your, your whole life, and then all of a sudden you're developing, you become sensitized to it. It, it can be really, it can be really scary. Um, someone asked when testing for food allergies, and this may get back to the first part of your talk, um, because you're talking about pollen food allergy syndrome, could testing during pollen season impact the results because of this cross reactivity? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, in, in, in sort of a general answer to that would be no, it would not because you, you're making those, what the testing is doing is looking for that specific IgE antibody response. There's cells in the skin, those mast cells that have, that's why we do a skin test because we're looking for that. We're doing it with say a, a birch pollen or a ragweed pollen, a commercial extract. And we're looking to see if, if that person has those antibodies and do they cross link them and, and release histamine and we get a response on the skin. It doesn't typically vary from the pollen season, whereas symptoms can vary. I mean, you're, you're exposed to a lot more birch pollen during that season, but with skin testing would be pretty true throughout the year when you test. So you could test out of the allergy season and hopefully pick up that allergic synthesization. So you don't, in other words, you don't just have to test them during the birch pollen season, I guess is what I would say. Yeah. Not like season specific testing. Exactly. Be For testing, no. Or not. Correct. Sure. Um, so we had a couple of questions and I don't know if this study can answer that, but just wondering if you had, if you could comment on it. Um, and I'll, I'll ask it in two ways, but do adults become desensitized to their allergens if you introduce a pet or dog or cat into your home? So this study is talking about exposure during pregnancy and, and, and infancy. Does this work later on in life if you're introducing an animal into the home later? Um, someone commented, it would be interesting to know if introducing a house pet for a person that's already living with food allergies, if they could help to reverse it, the negative impacts impacts of food allergies? I, I suspect the answer is, is no, but can you, can you comment? Can you comment on that? Right. Yeah, I would say no. And I'd say that, and first of all, we do not have good studies in that area. So this would be a good area where we would hopefully could get some studies. And I, one thing I was, I kind of was getting from the question was, say a person has cat allergy already, and then you bring a cat to home. Well, that's going to be problematic typically, because they're already sensitized to cat or dog. And then you bring a pet in the home and they're releasing their allergen. So, but if they have say just peanut allergy and they don't have cat allergy, I don't know. I can't answer that, that if you brought in a cat or a dog, would that, I, it, I don't think so at what we know at this point, but I, I stay tuned there. I, I don't, I, we don't have the studies to answer that question. Yeah. Yeah, I, I suspected the answer was, you know, we don't have enough information to know it. If it was a if it was that simple to reduce, you know, allergic reactions, simply introduce an animal to the home. Although owning an animal is definitely not simple. My dog is <laughs> my dog is wild. Um I I that would be a 
you know, a great treatment option. But as oh, I, do, I do want to mention something here for the audience that most of them would be familiar with this, and that's oral immunotherapy for foods. Many of you, maybe you're, you're you have children with food allergies, and they've under, they've started this process, or they're on it now. This is when you have an an individual who has a peanut allergy or milk allergy, or egg allergy, or all three of them, and you they undergo a process of immunotherapy that is is giving it through feeding oral immunotherapy OIT, and it's very has to be done very carefully and then under a doctor's supervision, allergist typically. And it's built up over time to get to a maintenance dose and then hopefully developing uh, some tolerance, maybe not complete, but what some people call bite proof or that they get, they, they get a, they maybe accidentally ingest and don't have a reaction. Uh, this is being done all over the world, all over the country. Many people are doing it now. You're, I'm sure most people in the audience know about this uh, treatment. Yes. Yes. And you alluded or you had mentioned, um, Split and you know subcutaneous immunotherapy yes. as, as yes. well. So that there are some treatment options depending on your case. You know every allergy case is different. Every individual is is different. Um, but but um, you know if you have questions, obviously ask ask your allergist about that. Um, okay, we have so so many questions that are coming in. This is great. Um, So I don't even know where to start. <laughs> One question um, that actually came in um, earlier was, is there such thing as a hypoallergenic dog? And I, I think the answer is no, because they, because their, their pet dander is, is everywhere. Correct. There are, there are many claims out there. If you go and then you got to be careful as you know, going on. On, on the internet and searching these kind of things, you'll see all kinds of claims, but scientific studies have shown there is not a truly hypoallergenic cat or dog because they are the allergen is made in, in they make it in the mem, in the mucosal membranes in the skin and it can come out. It's not just on, you know, even on a hairless dog or they still can produce the the dog allergen, uh, which can come out in in their saliva, in their saliva, their urine, in their skin, mucous membranes. So no, there there is not truly. You'll hear about this, and I can tell you're gonna you're gonna see it. But there truly is not a hypoallergenic pet that you can uh, purchase. Yes, yes, I, I had also suspected the answer was no, but I just wanted to hear it from a medical professional. <laughs> Um, for, for our audience, um, just getting back to um, decreasing sensitization or increasing tolerance, we, you know, already commented on, on, you know, introducing the pet and how that may help or, you know, how studies are still going, going on with that. But um, are there any specific food allergies that tend to decrease as the child gets older? Yes, that's a very good question. So, Typically, what we traditionally, I mean, from studies and from uh, food challenge data, natural history data, we know that typically cow milk, egg, wheat, soy, I'll just give you those examples, will typically with time, uh, children can become tolerant. Now, one thing I'll say here is that we used to think by three years of age, it was a really high percentage. We know now that it may be pushed out a little bit more into um maybe beginning of elementary school, even into elementary school. So, but those foods are the ones we think about where tolerance can be developed. On the other side, or other hand, peanuts, tree nuts, shellfish are the foods that are typically lifelong allergies. So there are groups of foods that are thought to be lifelong allergies, and there are groups where there can be a tolerance developed over time. So that's a great question. Yes, we've seen, and I, I am going to forget the exact ages, but um, we've seen just from interacting with the food allergy community that outgrowing a milk allergy or outgrowing an egg allergy um, is definitely more common than um, than peanuts and, and you mentioned shellfish as well, and, and tree nuts and, and shellfish as well. Um, okay, I think we have time for maybe one or two more. Um, this has been so great. Thank you all for sending in your questions and, and for just sharing your experiences. 
um, with, with pets and, and children. Um, you mentioned in the beginning half of the talk about the um, pollen allergies and then associated fruits and, and sometimes nuts, um, or I'll just say plants that are associated with that. Are there any environmental or pollen allergies associated with um, like byproducts from animals, so milk or, or eggs? So um, are there associations between, oh, I mean with foods like milk and egg? Mm -hmm. There are, and I think um, that would have to, I probably have to go back to that real big chart that had mm. the, the colorful chart. Not, not nearly, not, there would be very isolated foods that would do that. The typical ones are fresh fruits and vegetables, tree nuts, and some grains. I think the grains has become an issue that I wasn't, when I was in my training early in my career, that was not an issue. But with special people who have grass pollen algae, like to Bermuda, Kentucky Blue, Timothy, they can react, react have cross reactions with peanut and uh, tomato and things like that. So I think those are the big ones. I think certainly there could be isolated ones, but the ones I covered are definitely the major associations. And you mentioned that processing them in some way, whether it's cooking them or freezing them. Someone asked about peeling the the fruit. If you peeled an apple, would that help or would that still be um, problematic for someone with an um, with oral allergy syndrome? I did mention that briefly that if you, the peel, so if you have an apple or an orange or a plum or pear, if you, if you peel it completely, you take off the peel. That's where most of the allergen is just under these are these, these protein allergens are like enzymes that protect the, the plant, the food, the fruit. These are naturally there and they, they help in ripening and all sorts of things. That's part of the normal the food, but those unfortunately have out have, or can be allergenic for humans. So, but if you peel it completely and clean it, then it's less likely in some patients to cause a reaction. And that's probably a good point is to like rinse it off or clean it afterwards because anything that's on your hands from when you're peeling it, then touching the peeled part is just reintroducing it. It's like slicing a melon when you're, when yes. you're, uh, before you clean it, all the, you know, bacteria yes. can get on the inside. Anyway, I digress. I get into my food, ser food service uh, <laughs> education there. Um, that's all we have time for today. Thank you, Dr. James. Thank you. Thanks, audience, for your attention. And thanks, Tiffany, for moderating. Yeah, have a great day, everyone.